Welcome. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for coming to this talk on Ethiopia Wax and Gold, Discovering the Real Ethiopia. My name is Sam McManus. I'm the founder of Yellowwood Adventures. So when I was 30 years old, I quit my big boy job in the city because I was miserable and I decided to found a travel company and I decided to found a travel company in Ethiopia. Uh, there was just one small problem that I'd never been to Ethiopia before. Now these aren't really the actions of a sane individual but this is what happened and for some reason I chose Easy Ethiopia as the destination that I wanted to go to and, and start a business and I still to this day don't really know why but I just had that strange gut feeling that we all get sometimes and I followed it and things kind of worked out which is great. So Ethiopia is an enormous country and I just thought you know the best way to, to go and uh, experience the country for myself was literally go with a backpack and walk around and I did that for three months uh, for the first time I went there that was about three years ago. I've been back many times since but that first trip was still really one of the most magical because I just went, as I said, with a backpack and walked around for three months, just discovering the country, the people, and becoming acquainted with a culture that was completely new for me. Um, I'll try and break it down in, over this uh, short uh, talk of 30 minutes into the following six sections. Because Ethiopia is the size of you know, France and Spain combined, it's big and there's a lot to see. It's a very mountainous country. A lot of people call it the Tibet of Africa. Uh, in the south, in the Bali Mountains, which we'll talk about at the end. Oh, that clicker doesn't show up on here, it doesn't matter. Um, you know, it actually has the highest plateau in all of the African continent. It's literally the rooftop of Africa. If we look at a map of the country, uh, this is the Bali region down here. Uh, in the bottom where that plateau is before you come down into Kenya and then Addis Ababa, the capital in the, uh, in the middle and then the northern, more historical region uh, here where we're going to talk about the various different um, famous places and the, the things you can go to. So uh, breaking it down culturally, Ethiopia is has a population of over 90 million people and 82 languages are spoken there. It's very tribal, very interesting, diverse mix of cultures all living together. Uh, the main sort of cultural regions here are the Amhara region, Oromia here and Tigray in the north uh, with the famous Afar region here where the Danakil depression is. If we break it down um, topographically you can see also a huge range of diverse ecosystems and it, over here in the east the Afar where as I mentioned the Danical depression is it's the lowest and hottest place on earth it's hundred meters below sea level in the in the middle of, of the country it's sort of more mountainous and then definitely becomes drier as you come uh, up, up to the north to, to, to the Eritrean border down in the south it gets much more green. You even get almost practically rainforests uh, in the southwest. And this is big coffee country. So coffee originated in Ethiopia. It's the, the home of coffee. So even in one country you're looking at a huge varied range of, of peoples, cultures and ecosystems. And that obviously just makes it all the more fascinating as a country. To start with Addis Ababa, the capital city, a lot going on. I don't want to uh, dwell too much on the city. It's, you know, it's certainly not perfect. There's a lot of sort of buildings that have been started and not finished, but it has a fantastic nightlife. Ethiopian jazz is a thing. You may or may not know that. It's really, really good. And the Ethiopian people love going out, having a good time. So there's a really good, interesting bar and club and uh, nightlife scene in Addis. This is actually a picture of Mercato here. Um, where you can go and buy anything from, I don't know, fridge freezers to tinned mackerel to uh, fresh coffee. So we're going to start in the Simeon Mountains, which most people associate with Ethiopia, but I don't want to spend too long on it because it's almost become uh, in some ways a victim of its own success because nearly every tourist will come to Ethiopia, to Addis, fly up to Gondor and go to the Simeon Mountains. Now don't get me wrong, they're absolutely incredible. The views, it's kind of like a one-sided Grand Canyon. Uh, the views from about sort of 4,000 meters 
are absolutely stunning. There's beautiful endemic wildlife like the Walia ibex and the Gilada bleeding heart baboons. But Ethiopia is a big place and there's lots of places to see. You don't have to go to the Simeon Mountains. And because every, all the tourists are going there, for me, it's sort of, you know, you definitely get what, what it says on the tin. You get and you see the Ethiopian, you know, beautiful Simeon Mountains. But for me, there's so much more to the country and there's so many other places off the beaten track um, that I think if, uh, may potentially more worthwhile to go to. So this was me on this first trip uh, about three years ago. I bumped into a couple of uh, Israeli guys and we decided to travel around together in the Simeon Mountains. We hired a guide and a donkey to carry some of our cooking equipment and packs and there was me doing a little bit of first aid because he was uh, rubbing. Uh, so I had to put some antiseptic cream on in here. So the Simeon Mountains, absolutely breathtakingly beautiful but just one of actually many mountain ranges in the country which are far less visited. The place that is the second most visited is, is Lalibela. So it's an UNESCO World Heritage Site. It is home to 13, uh, 11th, 13th century rock-hewn churches. And what you're looking at here is Beta Georgis, or, or House of St. George. Um, and you know, in the West, well, Ethiopia was the second country in the world to become Christian for a start after Armenia. So they've been Christians for longer than Westerners have. But what's very interesting is that instead of building churches using rocks or bricks like we did, one on top of the, in, on top of the ground, they decided to come to mountain sides here, whether it was flat rock, and just with hammers and chisels, hammer down into the rock, this is a single piece of rock, through a door or through the windows and then hammer up to create the inside of a church. This is a single piece of rock here and it's absolutely breathtaking. These pictures um, were taken um, from just the beginning of this month. I went with a group um, of six tourists. We took a journalist from the National Press Association and a National Geographic photographer to experience the Festival of Gena. So the Ethiopians are Coptic Christians. They have a different calendar. Their Christmas falls on the 7th of January. And as you can see here, pilgrims walk for sometimes 20 days just to come to Lalibela, this sacred place, to experience Christians. And the reason Lalibela was, was built is a very interesting story. So King Lalibela, who was the reigning monarch in this region, uh, was poisoned by his brother in a power struggle, but he didn't die. He fell into a coma, and in that coma, he dreamt that the angel Gabriel came to him and said that he should build a new Jerusalem in Ethiopia, because back then, all of the, uh, it was kind of like the Hajj for Muslims to go to Mecca. Many Ethiopians were making a pilgrimage up to Jerusalem, and you know, many of them had never left their farmsteads. Uh, Ethiopia is almost like 95%. Uh, agrarian economy, most of the people are farmers there. They would go, some people would die on the way or they'd just get there and never come back. So he, in the 13th century, decided to build and, and well, carve this new Jerusalem literally into the mountains of Lalibela and it is absolutely one of the most breathtaking things you'll ever see. These again were, were, were pictures that were taken uh, um, around the Gena time in January. Just people breaking into spontaneous dance with drums. There was a masinko, which is the national uh, Ethiopian instrument. It's a one-stringed violin. And the churches themselves are just absolutely credible. You do actually feel like Indiana Jones because they're all linked by subterranean tunnels. And it's just extremely fun to go inside and get lost and, and then see all of the priests in their beautiful get-ups and the frescoes and these strange neon lights that makes it feel like a nightclub, but it's a nice touch. Yeah, here's some of the frescoes here. Um, you can see all of the um, images, Jesus, Mary, God, the prophets, are all uh, with Ethiopian features. So it's, it's a really interesting, different flavor of, of Christianity in many ways. In Ethiopia, it's the only place I've been to where God is actually depicted in pictures. So if you go to the Holy Trinity Church in Addis Ababa, there's pictures of three white dudes with beautiful long hair, and that's God. It's Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and God. And it's, you're like, whoa, I've never seen a picture of God before. It's great. 
So the Danakil, we'll take questions by the end, uh, at the end, by the way, if you have any. The Danakil depression is, as we saw in the map, it's in that north east region. It's one of the lowest and, and hottest in the world. And the Afar were the most dreaded tribe uh, in Ethiopia uh, throughout history. The famous uh, British explorer Wilfred Thesica was actually born in Addis Ababa. His father was a diplomat. And as a young man, he explored this region. Uh, and many of you um, may know him from Arabian Sands, the, the famous book where he crossed the Rub al Khali, uh, the empty quarter in Saudi Arabia with the Bedouin, and then he went and lived with the Marsh Arabs. Um, but as a young man, this is sort of where he cut his teeth, and he couldn't have picked a more dangerous place. So the Afar were famed for, A, just con always killing each other and warring and warring with other tribes. But as their show of manhood, the young men would uh, remove the testicles from their victim and tie them around the tops of their spears. And Thesiger um, wrote about this, how he'd actually witnessed it firsthand and said the boy came back looking so pleased with himself, like a young Etonian who'd just won his first rowing blue. And you're just like, a man's mental. Um, but here you can see it's just up here, um, bordering now uh, Eritrea. As you may know, there was a 20-year war with Eritrea and there'd been quite a lot of political tensions within um, Ethiopia itself as well. That was, they were, it was never to do with tourists or anything like that. It was mainly tribal conflicts. Uh, after the um, communists under Mengitsu were defeated by the rebels who came down from Tigray, the, the government was owned by mainly Tigrinya uh, tribal leaders. And the Aromia, who make up the largest part of the country, just were never happy with that. Abi, who has come in now as the president, uh, is from the Aromia region, so everything seems to settle down. And as soon as he came into power, <laughs> where a train and said, uh, should we just stop the war? And they were like, yeah, okay. And the next day, flights reopened, Ethiopian Airlines from Addis to Eritrea and families who hadn't seen each other for 20 years were reunited. Literally, it's just sometimes that simple. But the Danakil Depression is just otherworldly. You get these crazy formations of sulfur and natural minerals that come out of the ground. Um, but it's still a very hard life. You can see here the Afar. I honestly don't know how they still manage to survive in this region. Uh, they're definitely not un unhappy. Oh, actually, I just want to go back to this image uh, because still one of the main ways that, that people survive and, and make a living in this region is salt. So what you can see here is actually, this is salt here. These are salt flats and they take the camels out into the salt flats. They, they hack away these big blocks of salt. They load up the caravanserai with salt and then they walk them for days even weeks at a time into Ethiopia. And the further they get away from the Danakil Depression, the more valuable the salt becomes. But it's still an extremely hard way and to make a living, and, and they're still very poor. Obviously, salt isn't worth a huge amount of money. But one of the most amazing, this is a, a me again with my uh, two Israeli friends. Um, one of the most fantastic things to see in the region is the volcano of Erta Ale. So here you can see behind us, this is a lava lake. And it's literally from here down to here, molten lava. You hike up in the early morning, because in the daytime it's just way too hot. Um, and it's just like, if you've read Lord of the Rings, it's like climbing Mordor. You're just going up and you can just see this sort of smoke and this heat billowing out, reflecting off the cloud. And you get down to here and it's just the heat that comes off of this. I've never experienced anything like it. It's absolutely incredible. The other reason the Danakil Depression is so famous is for our great ancestor, uh, Lucy, uh, date, uh, the remains of which were dated to 3.2 million years ago. Um, Barack Obama, um, former US president, made a visit to uh, Addis Ababa and uh, met Lucy. And then he was giving a talk, I think, later at the UN. And he said she'd, he'd met our, our oldest ancestor and she said she was lovely which I thought was quite a nice touch. <laughs> so the Geralta Mountains are one of my favorite, if not my favorite place in Ethiopia. And this is where, you know, I have a tour company. This is where we tend to take most of our clients because it's, it's less um, 
sort of the less footfall than the Simeon Mountains, but you also get a much richer experience with the local people and culturally as well. So like Lalibela, um, there's a huge amount of, of rock churches carved up into the actual mountains. So, you know, you get to hike up the mountains and you're always rewarded at the top is like a cherry on the cake of this beautiful, either very small, originally a lot of them were hamlets, you know, holy men would go and just make, carve a small living space to live in and the local people would bring them up food. Um, and then over time, some of them became churches and some of them are massive. You go in in the mountainside and you open up and it's like, again, Tolkien, the mines of Moria, because there's these 16 enormous pillars holding up the mountain covered in these beautiful frescoes. So down on the plains, you know, you tend to walk up and then camp in the plains. Uh, there's beautiful sycamore trees. The local people come and uh, this is the Tigray region. Um, so their Tigrinya come and showed us their local dancing. This is the one stringed uh, violin, uh, the Masinko here. I mean, it's actually, it's kind of like the Africa of your dreams. It's just an absolutely beautiful uh, place. This is inside one of the churches. I was here actually the first time I went for Genna, which is the uh, Ethiopian Christmas. And the priests stay up all night. It's an all night service. And because of that, uh, they have these prayer sticks. So they're just sitting down here taking a bit of a break, but a lot of time they'll be standing up and they sort of lean on them because all nights, you know, a pretty long time to be up and praying. Here again, more pictures of uh, the Garalta Mountains. And there, here's some of a uh, uh, picture of some local Tigrinya women. Now I called um, this, this, the, the title of this talk, Wax and Gold. And there's a reason for that. So the obvious associations are Ethiopia is a very Christian country, wax, you know, for candles and gold uh, for the beauty, obviously, that they decorate their churches. And you go in and many priests, you know, will actually show you gold crosses that have been uh, kept in the, in, the, in the priesthood for centuries. But there's a deeper meaning as well. So it's, it's actually untranslatable, but in Amharic, there's a huge tradition of Amharic poetry and there's a way that they structure some of their poems that translates to wax and gold. And what it is, is you're, you're given, you know, a couple of lines and on the face of it, it has a simple meaning, a wax meaning, you know, that's what you see. And it was kind of like this. And the reason I bring it up now is because that first trip, I was sort of confronted with Ethiopia, but it was Africa and I didn't really know what was going on. I didn't understand the nuances of what I was seeing. So here I sort of see on the, on the surface, the wax surface, it was just, you know, some African women standing in a field. But Ethiopia has a depth to it that I haven't experienced in, in many countries. And, and this is how this ties into this wax and gold theory in, in the poetry. When you look at this poem long enough and you think about those lines, that wax melts away and a gold underbelly, a richness, comes out of the poetry. And I felt like that in the country as well. Because after a while, I got to understand the people and I would realize that, you know, their style of hair here, how it's very tightly braided at the top and then splays out at the back, is just purely Tigrinya style. So when I was then later in Addis Ababa, I would see women and I'd be like, oh, you're from Tigrinya, you're not Amhara. The same way you can see they wear seashells here, uh, embroidered, they were brought down from the Red Sea and traded as currency. And even on their Netella here, which is the name of the light women's shawl, the male one is called a Gabi. There's even a very rich, specific colored design here, again, just for that local area. And Ethiopia, you know, you just, it never gets boring. There's, the more you learn, the more interesting and the more rich it is. And I think that for me, and I've been to many countries in the world, many countries in Africa, but Ethiopia, yeah, I just keep going back. And you know, it's, there's always more to learn. And the more you learn, the more interesting it becomes. Here's just a picture of me in the sort of hiking in the, almost, almost like car, cowboy, cardboard cutout silhouette, like an old John Wayne uh, movie set in, uh, in the background. And here, just another uh, picture of, um, just incredible scenery of the Grauta Mountains. And that first trip, I was just staying with local people, their hospitality is incredible. They would, you'd always go in, you're always offered, well, two things, bunna, coffee, 
Obviously, coffee was first discovered in the southwest, in the um, southern nations. In, uh, coffee needs shade to grow, so it grew underneath the canopy of the, the rainforest. And injera. So injera is the staple food of Ethiopia. I'm sure many of you have heard of it. There's lots of Ethiopian restaurants in London. It's primary, if, if you go up to high altitudes, it's made from kolo, which is barley, but normally it's made from teff, which is a fine golden grain, and it's actually a superfood. So it's one of the reasons Ethiopians um, are so, so healthy and so skinny is because it actually has great weight loss um, properties, but it's also very nutritious and very good for you. So every time I go to Ethiopia, you know, I'm walking about in mountains and eating injera. I'm in great shape and then come back and ruin it here with beer and pizzas. So, um, yeah, so this is in uh, the Geralta Mountains. Again, the cherry on the cherry on the cake is the church of Abuni Yamata, which is carved into a huge stalagmite uh, that rises out of the ground. To, to get inside the church, you, they call it the scariest church in the world. I'm sure you've seen there's a BBC documentary about it. You have to walk around here and it's a, there's no health and safety. It's sort of a small passageway just cut into the side of the rock and a 200 meter drop down there. Um, so no one tends to rush that. But once you're inside, hollowed out of the rock, you're greeted with these beautiful frescoes uh, and, and beautiful designs. So Harar, poor Harar. Harar is in the city in the east and it's just so unvisited, um, but absolutely worth going to. It is completely unique, even in Ethiopia, because it was always traditionally the gateway between trade, between Africa and Arabia. You know, even goods, ivory, slave would come up from Kenya through the Rift Valley, be in Harar, that it would then go over the Red Sea into Saudi Arabia. And of course, stuff came the other way. So because of that, it's much more Muslim. Jugul, which is the uh, walls here, you can see surrounding the city is something like 46 mosques or something incredible. But inside, it's just, you know, everywhere in Ethiopia, well, in Kenya, when you go down Kenya, all the Maasai are wearing bright red, everyone's in red. In Ethiopia, everyone's in white. They love white gabbies. There'll be a small coloration, um, you know, around the, the edges of their shawls, but it's all white, but not hurrah. Hurrah, because it's a trading, it's a port city, um, well, close to the port. Um, the women wear the most fantastically beautiful, different colored uh, clothes and they even have their own language. It's again, very, very unique. One thing that also makes it interesting is that nearly everyone is addicted to drugs. Uh, they all chew chat. I don't know if you know what that is. It's a type of leaf um, that has uh, like very strong, um, I've forgotten the name of the type of drug now, qualities, but you can get very high from it and sort of about three to four o'clock in the afternoon, all work stops in the city and everyone just sits around chewing chat for the rest of the day. It's brilliant. Another really unique thing are the hyenas. So you can go out to the walls of the city and the hyenas have been tamed and you can come and you can feed them with a piece of meat on a stick and there's the famous hyena man who uh, is there to basically keep an eye on you. Now, I hadn't seen hyenas before I went to Harar and I thought they were kind of like cute and funny like in The Lion King. Not at all. They are terrifying. They're massive. Like you don't realize they come up to like this big. They've got these huge shoulders and disgusting gums that with like rotting flesh. And they didn't laugh at all. So I was actually pretty scared of them. Uh, but they are tame. How are we doing for time? Okay, so in the south, um, which I mentioned at the beginning. You, oh, one thing I did, sorry. Just one final note on Harar. Yeah, this, this building here is um, Haile Selassie. So Haile Selassie was the last emperor of um, Ethiopia before uh, he was killed by Mengitsu and, and the communist regi regime. Uh, and I wanted to, the reason I wanted to bring it up now, because he used to be the governor of Harar before he moved to Addis and, and became the emperor. So what's very, very interesting is uh, Haile Selassie was only his coronation name. His actual name was Tafiri. And he had the title of Duke, which in Amharic is Ras. So his name was Duke Tafiri, Ras Tafiri. Now, when Haile Selassie crowned himself emperor, 
There was a huge international fanfare and hoo-ha. It was very widely uh, publicised. Evelyn Waugh, a uh, famous uh, British writer, uh, had been uh, was uh, in Ethiopia previously. It was invited down to cover the coronation. It's very, very amusing. Um, uh, that's in his book, Re Remote Peoples. He, he later came back to cover the Italian uh, occupation, uh, which he called War in Assibia, Abyssinia, which is the old name for Ethiopia, except he spelt War, W-A-U-G-H, uh, by his surname. Very, very good. Um, but what's interesting is when Haile Selassie made all this great fanfare about being uh, coronated emperor, he traced his lineage back to Jerusalem and King Solomon. It's because the ancient story that every Ethiopian will tell you, and trust me, they will tell you, uh, was that the Queen of Sheba, who was Ethiopian and used to rule uh, in the ancient capital of Aksum, which is uh, near the Geralta Mountains, and also included modern-day Yemen, traveled up to Jerusalem, uh, had a son with King Solomon called Menelik. Menelik came back down with the Queen of Sheba, grew up in Ethiopia, but as a young man went back to visit his father, King Solomon, stole the Ark of the Covenant, and to this day it's believed it's uh, housed in a church called uh, Mariam, the house of Mary, uh, in northern Ethiopia. And then Menelik uh, became king after his mother passed away, and then Haile Selassie created this whole historical lineage that he was descendant from Menelik's descendants, and therefore he was descended from King Solomon. In Jamaica, the Jamaicans go, he's definitely the Messiah. And if you go back to his name, Tafiri, Ras, Duke Tafiri, Rastafiri, that's how the Rastafarian religion became about in modern history. They just said, yep, he's undoubtedly the Messiah, created their religion about him, and then uh, it's called Ascension Day. Haile Selassie actually flew to Kingston and apparently all of the Rastas came down to Kingston Airport. He couldn't even get off the plane. It was like consumed in a cloud of ganja smoke. Um, and I mean, sometimes just, you know, history is more, more incredible than fiction sometimes. So the Bali Mountains are the rooftop of Africa. Completely different uh, ecosystem. These are the fields of teff that golden fine grain superfood I mentioned that used to make injera. And again, completely like the Simeon Mountains, completely endemic wildlife. This is a mountain Nyala here. And the star of the show is the Ethiopian wolf. It's the rarest canid in the world. They're rarer than pandas. Uh, and they, but for in this small concentrated area, there's lots of them. They were decimated. The population was decimated uh, about five years ago by rabies because farmers would take or shepherds would take their flocks up onto the high plateau um, to graze for months at a time and their dogs, or they bit a wolf and, and it killed a lot of the population. But charities have been working to, to get the population back up and they're doing much better now. This was a pit, I mean, the, the Bali Mountains is a wild area. You can't just go off walking, you know. I, even by myself, it was the only place I actually hired a guide and some porters and we took horses with firewoods because you're above the tree line so you have to take wood up to make campfires and, and we hiked over that for about six or seven days down into the Harena forest which is a beautiful uh, covered cloud forest where wild coffees grow uh, and there's even a lion or two but I've never actually seen them. It's also home to the second highest mountain in Ethiopia, Tulu Dimtu which means red mountain at 4377 meters the highest mountain is in the Simeons, that's Ras Dashin. It's about, uh, it's just uh, 4,500 uh, and change. I can't remember the exact number. And then, as I said, you come down off the plateau, back into this beautiful, um, just, it's just very different to anywhere else in the country. It's almost like another country. Horses, you know, it's perfect for horses, whereas in the north it's just too dry. They always seem to sort of die, so they use donkeys much more. But in the south, you know, there's nothing more fun than getting on an Ethiopian horse and, and, and galloping around. And of course, the coffee is absolutely excellent. This was a picture taken from uh, earlier this month. Uh, in Genna, I just wanted to show this, that every time we go and we take, even when I was by myself or when I take tourists, just the hospitality of people is just unsurpassed. This was just a local family. We were just walking past their house in the mountains and they said, come in for Buna and Injera and we just took a little uh, group shot there. 
So my time is up. Uh, please do follow us uh, on Instagram. Our stand is D39. It's literally next to the other theater on the balcony on that side. I'm giving away Ethiopian coffee, so please do come and try some and, and chat to me if you're interested. So thank you very much for your time, and if you have any questions, please do let me know. Yes, please. Sorry, do you have a microphone? Sorry, one second. Double question. Best time of year to go and any security issues? Sure. So the only time not to go really is our summer. So June, July, August when that's the rainy season. Uh, but any other time is fantastic. Their calendar has 13 months and the sort of Ethiopian government's catchphrase is 13 months of sunshine, which it is. Just don't go in the rainy season because the roads are dreadful. Security issues, as I said, they had some issues about two years ago, but it was all in sort of internal political issues, and they've really settled down now that Abbey uh, is, is in power. The only sort of places that still come up on a sort of red flag are just the borders. You know, Ethiopia is a good country in a bad neighborhood, essentially. Somalia, Sudan, even northern Kenya, it's just those borders, but you don't, unless you're crossing into another country, you wouldn't normally go to those border areas anyway. There was a question here, please. No, this lady next to you. Have they made the access up to um, Abu Yamata any easier? Ah, so yes, so good knowledge. So the access to Abu Yamata, the scariest church in the world in the uh, Geralta Mountains, you sort of hike a short way up sort of normal, um, just rock track really, but then there is a section where you have to scramble up. So they have, whereby there's always guides there, or guides, they're sort of local Ethiopian helpers, but they've hooked up a harness, very simple with a rope. But more important than that, like it's actually very difficult to fall off, but they just are there to support you, put your hand here, put your foot there, no one falls off. So it's totally doable for all ages. You've done it. Glad to hear it. <laughs> are there any other questions, please? No. Oh, yeah, just one here. How has it been to do this? Well, I, well, you know, sp speaking as a tour operator, we do trekking tours. But, so I'll speak about what we do and then but about the country in general. So what we do, you're walking five to six hours a day. You don't have to carry your own stuff because we have porters who carry that all for you. We welcome anyone, regardless of experience or age. We just want to show you this amazing country. You don't, I'm biased. I've talked about mountains and checking a lot. So that's what I love doing. You don't have to do that. We do, we provide an Ethiopia cultural tour, for example, and many other providers do as well. You don't have to go up walking into these mountains. Mountains. You could just visit Addis, visit Lalibela, visit Harar. Uh, I'm just biased, so I've leaned the presentation more into mountains. But it's a very mountainous country, and for me, to meet the local people, there's no better way than walking through a country. If you're in a 4x4 the whole time and separated by a window, it's so much harder to get invited into people's houses, to smell the country, to just get a real feel for it. So that's just personally how I like to travel. But no, you don't have to be a superstar, or it's not like a military route march, it's a holiday, <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Yes, just this lady here. Just like to ask about language and whether English is widely spoken or other European languages. Yeah, so as, as I mentioned, within the country they speak 82 languages. The main language is Amharic. But a lot of the, the tourist infrastructure is, is developing. A lot of the guides speak excellent um, English for starters. There's many French and Spanish speakers. And even because Israelis love to go there, there's even some guides who speak Hebrew. That's not a problem. With the local people, just the international language of sign language, I managed to get around. Because as soon as you go to a different place, they spoke a different language anyway. So it's, not, it's, it's totally workable. You, that's not an issue to be worried about. Just what, gentleman at the back? Hi. I was just wondering if 
Yeah, it's okay. So I traveled around, you know, the first time completely by myself. It's totally doable. It's not glamorous. Um, long bus journeys. You know, we fly to these hot points where, because instead of driving for a day and a half, you can fly there in an hour for $50. It's a no brainer. There's loads of cheap places to stay. The quality of them definitely varies. But if you just want to go around there and rough it, absolutely. Completely safe. It's one of the safest countries in Africa. That's not an issue. You'll always find somewhere to stay. You know, whether they've got a mosquito net or how clean it is is a different question. Sorry, could you turn the mic back on? Oh. Yeah. I was just wondering if uh, how the banking works if there's loads of ATMs everywhere now or people are handling. Yeah, yeah, so the, uh, the local currency is Burr. Um, you can just go, there's ATMs in the main cities like Makele in the north, Addis Ababa, obviously, Lalibela. I just go with it. I mean, I take dollars as a backup. Dollars work everywhere in the world. But yeah, you can just go with your bank card and, and take money out. But just like, don't expect to find them in the small towns because they'll just have the local Ethiopian banks that aren't hooked up to international banks. But yeah, in the main cities, absolutely. But just take big watches out and then have dollars as backup. You'll be absolutely fine. Oh, a gentleman asked that before. Just, just not in our summer, June, July, August, the rainy season. Any other time's fine. Okay, brilliant. Thank you very much, everyone. Please do come and see me for some Ethiopian coffee. Thank you.